Hey, this is Robert Welkner with CoinOp TV. I'm up in San Jose at the California Extreme's 10th anniversary show. Come on in with us. We're going to check out the games and the collectors and whoever else is running around inside. Okay, well, inside California Extreme, I caught up with Paul Dean from Riverside, California, who holds the world record in Spy Hunter and Frenzy. Paul, good to meet you. Thanks for coming yeah, on the show. Nice to meet you. Tell me a little bit about some of your records there, starting with Spy Hunter. Yeah, the, the, the Spy Hunter, I did that uh, score back in uh, 1985, uh, the third annual Masters Tournament, uh, June, June 28th of 1985, and uh, was over in Upland Arcade during the, uh, it was a Guinness contest. They can, the high scores go into the Guinness Book, so that was a really a important contest. Mm -hmm. So I was able to uh, win the contest after 11 and a half hour game. I, uh, you know, walked away with the world record. Okay, now, uh, Spy Hunter, can you give us some uh, tips at all of, uh, you know, some little tricks maybe? Well, you know, it's, it's mostly a common sense game. If people get too excited with that gas pedal and they they, they push it all the way down and they're just gonna they're just gonna crash. You're gonna go out of control. So just be moderate on the gas pedal and, and try not to die. Okay. Uh, the main thing is the oil slick. You, you want to use the oil slick. Uh, uh, don't use it too much because you want it to last throughout each season. And uh, people tend to use the uh, weapons too soon. And, and once they use up other weapons, they're pretty much helpless to, to uh, you know, protect themselves. So when you, uh, when you go to bed at night, do you have the uh, dun, 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 dun theme song in your head? Oh, of course. You know, it's, uh, uh, I always tell everybody, you know, who, who doesn't want to be James Bond, you know, spy hunter? So this is my my chance to be James Bond for a few minutes. Okay, we got Aaron Giles, who's uh, one of the coordinators over at MAME. Can you tell me what MAME is? So MAME is a uh, arcade emulator, and the purpose of it is to sort of document how all these arcade games worked uh, by basically recreating their hardware in software and um, using the original software that's programmed onto the arcade boards. Um, by We simulate the hardware that that ran on and then reproduce the experience on your PC. Very cool. So uh, so what's the vibe here now with your California streams? It's like a dream come true, seeing all the coin ops in, in live and in person? Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a pilgrimage of sorts. I mean, I come here pretty much every year for the last seven, eight years, and it's always been a great show. It's to get to see a lot of the same games, a few different ones every year, and uh, there's always something that I see when I'm here that I'm like, oh, we did not, I'm doing that one right in May, and we gotta, we gotta improve on that. Greg Maletic who is the filmmaker who made The History of Pinball. Greg, thanks for being on the show. Tell me a little bit about your documentary. Well, it details the, the story of the last few years of Williams Pinball. Um, it basically tells the story of the Pinball 2000 series of machines, which as most Point Up TV viewers probably know, is just the last couple of machines Williams built in an effort to try and kind of uh, reinvent the pinball industry. And so it tells the story of the design effort that went into that and all the business decisions and all the pinball design that went into making that machine happen and kind of the decisions that led to Williams ultimately shutting down their pinball group and deciding to make uh, video slot machines instead getting out of the pinball business. So as a, uh, as a documentary filmmaker um, what kind of travels and places did you visit to uh, make, you, make this product? Well for pinball there's actually really only almost one place to go and that's Chicago. Everyone who's in the pinball industry is in Chicago. That's where pinball's always, it's always been its home and so I visited a lot of the ex-Williams employees there. I interviewed probably a dozen or so of them. Um, so that was most of my travels but I've also gone to some various pinball shows around the country. I've come to this show a few times. I've been to Pinball Expo in Chicago. I've been to, uh, let's see, Pinagogo over in Dixon and uh, also a show called Pinball Odyssey up in Medford. Very cool, very cool. Well, um, you know, so like, uh, is there like one central theme or something you'd like to convey as your sort of your audience when, when they get to see this? Well, I mean, when I started the film, I actually approached it as not really being a pinball story so much. I saw it as just an interesting story about business and about product design. I didn't really know much about pinball when I started the project, but through the project I've come to really like it a lot. Um, I guess the, 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 the theme, I guess, is sort of, I think, how elusive success is. These guys were the best in the industry, were incredibly talented, 
and in a way did everything right, and yet they still managed to fail somehow. And so it, it, I think it's sort of the difficulty in succeeding. It's more than just hard work and being the best at what you are. Okay, well, uh, inside California Extreme, we got uh, Playland, Not at the Beach. I'm here with Richard Suck, who's involved with that. Tell me a little bit about Playland. Playland, Not at the Beach is a family fun center museum that's opening this fall in the town of El Cerrito. Admission is totally free. In fact, there's no way to spend money there at all. It's 9,000 square feet of absolute manic fun. There's antique pinball machines, video games, modern games. There's a uh, skilled carnival where we teach everybody how to win the prizes. In fact, all the games are rigged, so you can't possibly lose. Our goal is to make everybody stay happy, so there's no losers at all. We've got all sorts of shows, a little movie theater, the world's largest hand-carved miniature circus, a Santa's village with 200 little tiny trained elves that do amazing things for the kids on demand. We've got two haunted attractions. It's a repository of some of the best video and arcade games in all time, and all of it is run by volunteers. We've been six years building it. We're about to open this fall. You've got to come and spend some time and win some prizes. So what do you do with the Arcade Flyer Archive? Well, it's basically an online library of video game flyers, uh, all you know, arcade coin-out machines that people can go and just view. You know, it's, it's basically a library, and it's, for, as far as I'm concerned, it's preserving you know the history uh, of the early video game industry. But it's also about graphic design history, and certainly it captures the nostalgia of everybody who's experienced these video games, especially in their childhood. You know, they come across the site and they're really wowed being able to see these flyers and remember the games that they used to play. And uh, a, lot of, a lot of times these people go beyond the nostalgia and they actually want to buy these games, you know. So I get a lot of emails saying, oh, where can I buy these games? Or they even think sometimes we're a store where you can buy these games, and that's not true. It's really just a library. So, And half the collection, half the archive is actually made up of my personal flyer collection. So I actually have 2,800 flyers at home in binders that I keep. Because uh, I started out as a contributor to the Arcade Flyer Archive. Uh, the original founder, Gerard, um, would receive my contributions and he would put them up there. And I guess he got sick and tired of me submitting so many, so he eventually gave me access and I just started doing it myself. All right, well, I've caught up with Jerry Ellsworth here at the show. Jerry, good to see you. I understand that you're a collector and hobbyist yourself? Yes. Uh so I, I collect 8-bit uh, consoles and pinball machines and old arcade machines. What are some of the pinballs you have? So I have a Time 2000, Atarian, Black Belt. So what about some of the 8-bit stuff you collect? Oh, the classic 8-bit Nintendo and Vectrex and uh, you know Sega Master System uh, and all of its various hardware and accessories. So uh, in addition to collecting, I understand you do a little uh, behind the scenes of some things. Are you involved with Commodore or something? Yeah, well, the Commodore 64 was my first computer. And uh, I was lucky enough to uh, land a contract to reverse engineer the Commodore 64 chipset and uh, turn it into a toy that uh, they, it was, eventually was called the Commodore 64 uh, 30 in 1 uh, plug and play. Essentially, it's just a joystick with uh, 30 built-in video games. And how did uh, how did they go about selecting the games in the 30-in-1? I believe it was mainly uh, they uh, landed a deal with Epics or the the owners of the Epics title. So it was mainly Epics and a few other uh, um, you know companies. So that's it was mainly heavily loaded with Epics games. Okay, so. Uh, so let me ask you this, I understand you're up in Portland there, we got some cool arcades uh, with Ground Control, oh, do you yeah. go there often? Yeah, I head up to Ground Control, you know, very often. It has lots of pinball games, somewhere probably around 15 pinball games and, uh, you know, 20, 25 uh, arcade machines or more. What, uh, what else on the side? I understand you have kind of a day thing or a nighttime thing that you do. Uh, you're running around here on roller skates, anything you can tell us about that? Yeah, well, in my spare time I do roller derby. Uh, up in the Portland area with the Rose City Rollers. I got uh, Eric Hightower, who was one of the lead programmers of Rush 2049. One of the things that's unique about San Francisco Rush, again, that came all the way from the hard drive, and is the force feedback steering. And Atari actually owns the patent for force feedback steering. So anytime you see a force feedback steering wheel, you can know that they're paying royalties to Atari for that original invention. Uh, Atari not being in business, I'm not sure they still are, but when I was working there, they were getting concerned. So that force feedback steering, the five channel audio, 
and also the link gameplay experience that it's an entire seat that you can sit down in and everybody knows how to drive a car or at least they want to someday so they all have a frame of reference for what they're supposed to do so it's a really good casual gameplay experience for somebody who doesn't necessarily play arcade games all the time. Any little tips you can give uh, players when they're out there messing around? Yeah, I think my favorite tip from Rush 2049 involves using the view buttons to make sounds. So there's a special area on track three right at the finish line on say the second lap. Come down the hill, go between the arches and there's a jump off to the right. If you go into view two, while you're in view two, you hit the view two button again you'll get a Dixie horn sound like the Dukes of Hazard. So it's kind of the Then after that, you do that while you're in the air and after that, you hit the view one button and then it'll go yee-haw. Okay, well I have Kevin Teal here who is a photographer and one of the things that he likes to do is take pictures of pinball machines. Kevin, good to see you. Tell me a little bit about what you do. Uh, thank you, Robert. Um, you know, this is a series I started about a year and a half ago. I kind of just wanted to explore the game from the ball's perspective, and I kind of married my interest of playing pinball and photography, and I thought it would be an interesting technical challenge to try and shoot a metal sphere within the architecture of the playfield. So for me, it's kind of like trying to make a new picture of something we've seen our whole lives. One thing we like to do when we're up at California Extreme is check out the pinballs and some of the classic uh, pinballs that are hard to find. I found Dan Kramer here, who is a collector and uh, extraordinaire of some of these. Dan, good to see you. Tell me a little bit about some of your games you brought to the show. Uh, well, I tend a lot of games. I don't always bring a lot. Uh, in this case, I'm helping Dale Luck with his Atari lineup, which includes all six of the production widebody games made in the late 70s, and three prototypes, which were generally made in quantities of one, two, or three. Usually, they uh, don't progress far enough to have all features, but in this case, we have a couple with artwork, and then we have one that is a white wood, which has no actual formal artwork, which makes it all the more unusual and rare. Those typically were not allowed to get outside the company in most of the pinball outfits. What's, uh, what's some of the um, strengths or weaknesses of something that uh, sort of they have that are unique to some of these games that not people, people don't see very often? Uh, Atari was a pioneer in the development and production of solid state pinball. Uh, their first models were some of the very first ones th to appear in the marketplace. Uh, they tried to come up with a new cabinet format with a wide body. Uh, a lot of people didn't particularly get off on that. But by the time they got to the sixth model, which was Superman, they sort of hit their stride and that was actually a great game. Uh, but after that, they didn't really progress much further on, on pinball into production. Uh, however, the, the actual use of cutting edge technology was done in a good number of instances by Atari over the Chicago pinball companies. They used uh, proximity sensors and uh, other features that would have um, possibly not been done by the Chicago companies because they didn't consider them to be um, affordable or they weren't that technologically oriented. So Atari sort of pushed the forward envelope of pinball in a good number of ways while it was in the marketplace. We caught up with Mike and Jem, who have the mobile pinball, the Little Juju. Let me creep on over here and ask you guys a little bit about it. Tell me about Little Juju. Well, uh, it's a modified Spartan Manor. It's an old 1947 travel trailer. It's like Cadillac of travel trailers. It's not an Airstream. And we uh, pop the body off, reinforce the frame, put in hydraulic lifters so that we can just basically pull up, push a button, and it levels itself automatically. We got six uh, old electromechanical machines in there. Uh, we put in a battery box in the bottom that holds uh, 1,200 amp hours of 12 volt juice, so we can run, we figure, about a day and a half on battery power. Charge it up at home, eventually we'll have solar panels on top. So we'll be like a green machine, essentially. So Jim, I understand that back home there's a bigger collection of these games? Uh, yeah, that's true. In Alameda, we've got the Lucky Juju uh, Pinball Parlor, 713 Santa Clara Avenue in Alameda. We've been there for almost five years now. Uh, it's a collection of about 30 games. Open to the public Friday and Saturday night from 6 to midnight. Uh, you can go to ujuju.com to check it out and see the details and some pictures. It's a really great thing. All right, guys, we're going to wrap things up at California Extreme. Thanks for tuning in. For Coin Out TV, this is Robert Welkner.